Uh, so, hi, my name is Meredith Rose. Uh, I'm a policy counsel at a public interest group called Public Knowledge uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and we work on consumer advocacy and tech issues, copyright, telecom, some privacy stuff, uh, and that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> hey folks, I'm the moderator. All right, uh, please go ahead. I just did. She just finished. All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll just go down the line. We were being kind or not actually yakking while she was talking. We've been learning manners of the off year. I'm Courtney Lytle. I'm a local attorney. I also teach at Emory Law School. I'm kind of the academic on the panel. That's usually my part to play. Um, I'm actually probably going to start us off with kind of a little 101 because lawyers have a lovely habit of using words in a particular way and we all know exactly what we mean but it's not what the word actually means in English and we may use the same word two different places in a completely different way which indeed is the case here um, and none of it means what you think the word means so I'm going to translate it a little bit so if we inadvertently slip into legal you may still know what we're talking about instead of saying, no, you just said the opposite. I'm like, well, I did, but that was with the other kind of that word, which sounded the same to the rest of you. Um, so that, that's often my part on the panel. I'm also an intellectual property lawyer, so copyright issues and IP issues all along the spectrum are kind of my thing. Um, I don't think I have anything else of interest to say. I would pump my book, but it's a textbook, and there's no point. <laughs> Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I don't have a book or textbook, so don't have that to sell to you. Um, I am the U.S. Policy Manager at... On. Yeah, good. Thank you. Normally I can hear myself back at myself, and I can't this time, which is for the best, really. Um, I'm U.S. Policy Manager group called Access Now, which is an international organization. We have offices all over the world working on the intersection of technology and human rights. Uh, I manage our Washington DC, there now I can hear myself. <laughs> um, I manage our Washington DC office um, where we routinely interact with um, Congress and kind of the executive branch now, um, but we also provide commentary back to our other offices in different places. Hello, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm uh, the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We are a uh, nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online for things like privacy, uh, free speech, innovation. Uh, we do uh, a lot of uh, uh, impact litigation uh, and working on some things in the uh, uh, cell phone privacy uh, space and have been trying to uh, keep your cell phones private for, for many years. Hi, my name is Blair Chintella. I'm a local attorney based in Kennesaw here. Um, I started off doing copyright uh, work as well. Um, now I've moved into a totally different area, and um, I've been speaking on these kinds of issues for about five or six years now at DragonCon. All right. Well, uh, let's get this uh, started. Um, Courtney, uh, did you want to give a Fourth Amendment uh, yeah. overview? I thought I would give you all kind of the 101 version, um, and I will try to stop myself before I get into the really interesting stuff that I like to drag into because it's the best exam questions for law students because the whole point of a law school exam question is to take what was sort of a straightforward question and then torture the facts until it's really bizarre and see what the students can do with it. That would be the opposite of where we're supposed to go today, so I'm trying to keep myself in check. We're starting with the Fourth Amendment. Hopefully you all are familiar with that, at least vaguely. It's your basic search and seizure stuff here. This is where I'm going to start by saying there, the word privacy is one that's, I think, in the title of our panel today. But most people, when they talk about the right to privacy, are thinking about um, the more family-based rights, the abortion, marriage, those kinds of things that's called the right to privacy, which, just like where privacy comes into the Fourth Amendment, is not actually written in the Constitution anywhere. But that's a different line of, um, different line of jurisprudence. So when we're talking about privacy, it has nothing to do with Griswold v. Connecticut, Roe v. Wade, or any of those. Same word, different thing completely. This when we get to privacy in the Fourth Amendment, I'm about to read you the text. You'll notice the word's not there, but we'll get to it in a second. So, for funsies, here is the relevant part of the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects 
against unreasonable search and seizures shall not be violated. It goes on to talk about warrants, which have to meet certain requirements, but we're not really doing warrants today, so we're going to stick with the search and seizure part. The fewer words, the better. So it's the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Okay, because we're lawyers, and because judges are by definition lawyers, you very seldom see a case that just directly answers a big question like, can we search your cell phone? It usually comes up on a narrow question, and it's usually some element from this, those, that original language in the Fourth Amendment. The first one, as a threshold level, is was there a search? And now search is another thing that because it's the constitutional language, there's tons of cases about what may or may not be a search. And it's one that I really like doing um, exam questions on because some of the results are kind of random. A police dog sniffing your suitcase is not a search generally, but a policeman standing on your doorstep where he has the right to be, he's not trespassing, and his dog sniffing your door probably is a search. Same dog, same sniffing, different result. So what amounts to a search is sometimes very important in these cases. And if we, because if there's no search, then you haven't been subject to an unreasonable search and the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. Some of the cases hinge on whether there counts as a search. We tend to use the word as, you know, search, looking for stuff. If I'm looking for stuff, I'm searching good enough. Not for lawyers. We have particular ways to get about that because it's what we do. We torture the language. We get paid by the word. <laughs> so we've got the searches. Um, the question then, if there was a search, is was it reasonable? So you notice it tells us that the right to be secure from unreasonable search and seizure. So some search and seizure is okay, but not unreasonable search and seizure. Okay, y'all have been around lawyers long enough. Just by being in the room with us for a few minutes, you know that what's reasonable and not reasonable is a big murky spot. And that doesn't really give the judges any true guidance as to what is reasonable. This is where we're getting to privacy. I promised we'd get there. The way that the jurisprudence has pretty much developed and again, this would normally be several classes. So I'm cutting it into like 10 minutes or less. So I'm glossing over a lot. But what generally counts as a reasonable search is one that does not violate a reasonable, there's that word again, expectation of privacy. So that's where the privacy comes in. It's our reasonable expectation of privacy. And often there's a second part to the equation, which is, and your individual expectation of privacy and one that society would also find reasonable. So just because I think this is really private, if y'all say, no, seriously, that's not private, there's sometimes the judges will look at both of those levels of that. Now, general, um, when it gets to that expectation of privacy, we often are going to be talking about where the person was and what they were doing. Things that are done in public really have no expectation of privacy. I really can't claim any privacy rights sitting up here. I have no reasonable expectation of privacy. I'm speaking to a whole bunch of you, and there's a camera pointed at me, which I try not to think about because it makes me nervous. So Sorry. I have absolutely no reasonable expectation of privacy here, and if anyone asked society, they'd say, dude, you're on a stage. You have no expectation of privacy. If you're standing hypothetically on a street corner in Atlanta on Labor Day weekend downtown, yeah, no expectation of privacy. If you're inside your house with the blinds drawn, there's probably your highest expectation of privacy. Now, we used to do exam questions also with, okay, you're inside the house, but you're, you have a table up against the kitchen window and the curtains are open and there's a big pile of white powder on the table and a cop walks by. Okay, and then when we talk, what if there's a sign in the big pile of white powder? I, I always envision the, um, the bird, free bird seed in the Roadrunner cartoons that says cocaine. Now if a policeman walks by and sees that, if he has seen something from where he's allowed to be and can clearly see, well, he can usually come in and say, dudes, I'm sorry, you're too stupid to be criminals, you're going to jail. <laughs> so your legal takeaway is if you have a ginormous pile of cocaine in your kitchen, close the windows and take the sign out of it. We talk also about specific exceptions or exemptions. 
There are times when, even though normally this would have been a search and it would have been unreasonable, we allow it because there's a particular reason. We will be talking about border patrol, or not border patrol so much, but border enforcement here. If you are coming into or leaving the country, the government has a heightened right to search whatever you got with you because the government is deemed to have a higher right to patrol who's coming in and what they're taking out than just who's walking around on the street quirk of the law and so that's one of the exceptions so if you're on the border and you're trying to go in or out of the country you're going to have a lower expectation of privacy um, a couple other exceptions I mean the one that people usually know about is like public safety if someone is running through oh say the host hotels here screaming I'm going to blow everyone up and we think he may mean it, because he's not cosplaying as something who says that a lot, yet the cops now suddenly have a right to check and see if he has a, um, has a bomb under his coat just because this is public safety, we don't have time to go and get a warrant and come back. Because if by then there's going to be lots of dead people and body parts, we can just check now. So that kind of exigency, public safety things, um, there are other exigency ones, but they don't really come into play here. Um, Another one that is not nearly as interesting as public safety is the third party sort of exception. And this goes into another issue where we're talking about subpoenas more than searches. If I have business records held by someone else, like a bank, the bank knows who I write checks to or who I do online payments to, I, according to this doctrine, no longer have any expectation of privacy because I've already given these records to someone else. The old rule here was, um, it was very common from the phone company. Police can't tap a phone without a warrant, but they can get the phone records from back when there used to be a phone company and your phone used to be attached to the wall. Um, they could get the records for your phone from the phone company, again there was one of each of those, and they could find out who you had been calling. And they could subpoena that information because it wasn't a search, it wasn't protected, and you had already, you know, these weren't your records, these were the phone company's records. So you have no expectation of privacy in someone else's records, like Bell South or Ma Bell or whoever it was at the time. That becomes an issue in one of the big cases here because it went from, when that doctrine originated, it was things like your check records, which frankly can track pretty much everything you do, but things like, you know, where you called from your home is different from where your cell phone has been. So the old rules don't neatly apply here, and the question, as always for the law, is okay, we know what the rules were, but society just changed again and invented new stuff again. So we've got these old rules. How do we apply them to this new stuff? And that's pretty much where we are today. Um, one little, the one academic thing I can't stop myself from saying, although it's completely irrelevant today, is keep in mind when you're talking about the Fourth Amendment, if you have been subject to an unreasonable, unlawful search and or seizure, the only remedy you tend to have is suppression of that information. So if you are indeed one of the drug dealers in one of our cases today, if you are fortunate and have good lawyers, you can get the evidence suppressed, which means if they built the case based on knowing where your cell phone was, suddenly they have no case because that evidence is suppressed. Notice that if you're some nice guy who's following the rules and the police break in and rip apart your um, photography studio in San Francisco was the case we read about and tear it apart and say, oops, sorry, you got nothing because there's nothing for you to suppress. So the people who are not guilty of wrongdoing really have no remedy in the case of a violation. The people who are doing something naughty they benefit because all the evidence can be suppressed. That one's not really a point. Let's go back to the cell phone stuff. And this is where we can move it out. All right. So uh, I think where we'll go next is to cover uh, device uh, uh, searches, and in particular in the border context. So, uh, gotcha. yeah. <laughs> it was all there in the name of the panel. Two of the cases that were mentioned uh, are border search cases. Uh, and so I guess first just briefly you know what the border is one of those places where things operate a little bit differently um, and uh, uh, there, there's a sort of 
the border search exception, basically that that where things where you might uh, be obviously requiring to to get a warrant elsewhere at the border, uh, the at least uh, Customs and Border Patrol and Immigration's Customs Enforcement uh, assert and have policies that they can do suspicionless searches of, of things at the border. And by border, I mean, obviously there's the physical border, uh, but border also counts like international airports. Uh, sort of border-like places, uh, and they assert that this right extends uh, 100 miles from uh, from the border. And if you actually sort of mapped out uh, 100 miles from all of the U.S. borders and then like look at the international airports and such, you would find that most, the vast majority of the population lives within that zone. Um, so we have, we have two cases that we were going to uh, talk about uh, today, uh, Al-Assad and Kolsuz. Uh, so um, Want to, I should probably talk about Al-Assad because that's a case that EFF, my organization, filed. Uh, someone want to take Kolsuz? Sure. All right, so Kolsuz. Uh, <laughs> Kolsuz, I mean, I, I, I can I go can. for it if you want to go do, for do it. Do Al-Assad first. I'll do Kolsuz. All right, so uh, Al-Assad. So the Al-Assad is, is a case that, uh, that we filed last year uh, where we're representing uh, uh, 11 people who uh, were subject to device searches at the border. Uh, so there were 10 of them were U.S. citizens, one was a lawful permanent resident, uh, and when they crossed the, uh, the border, uh, they were uh, subject to uh, device searches. Uh, sometimes the, the, the device was uh, searched for, you know, uh, held for a long period of time. Sometimes it was uh, relatively shorter. Some of the, some of the, the facts will, will uh, vary. Um, so this is actually a case that hits a couple of things in because it also hits the, the search and the seizure aspects of uh, the Fourth Amendment uh, on account of them holding on to the phone. Uh, so what is the law surrounding what, uh, what is allowed at the border and, and such? Well, it kind of varies by circuit. And you may be saying, well, what, what does he mean by circuit? Uh, the United States is divided into various circuit courts of appeals. So there are 11 uh, geographic districts uh, where uh, <coughs> there is a different court of appeal in each one, plus there's like some specialty ones that like the, uh, the military has one, there's a, a federal circuit. Um, and uh, sometimes these court of appeals come up with a different idea of how the law should apply. And so then that becomes the rule in their circuit, and then you might have a different rule in a different circuit. And then uh, when there is a circuit split, uh, often this is resolved by the Supreme Court because that applies across the across the land. Um, so right now we have a bit of a circuit split in terms of the standards uh, at the border. Uh, so depending on on which jurisdiction, it might be that no uh, no suspicion is needed to uh, to conduct a search, uh, or it might be that uh, they. Uh, reasonable suspicion is needed to do a forensic search, but no suspicion is able to do a manual search. Well, and what is sort of the difference between a forensic and a, and a manual search? So uh, a manual search would be, you know, you're at the border, they say, hey, can I look at your phone? You hand it to them, they sort of flip through it a little bit. Oh, that's nice. Oh, but it's locked. I'm going to have to do a forensic search now to uh, try to get into that or uh, demand your password, perhaps, and then you'll say, no, Amy would definitely say no. Um, so the forensic search is when they hook it up to a device uh, to gather the the data on it. If it is unlocked, they just you know it's pretty easy for them to do that. If it is locked and they need to hack the phone, depending on what kind of phone it is, that might be hard or easy. Um, but that that's sort of a, a forensic uh, search was a, a deeper dive. Um, and so one of the things that, that uh, was the inspiration for the, for the al-Assad case uh, was a case called uh, Riley versus California, a Supreme Court case. Riley versus California also dealt with phone searches, and it dealt with them in a different context where searches were allowed without a warrant. Uh, and that was search incident to arrest. So uh, when you're arrested, the police are allowed to conduct a search uh, and the sort of the justification for why they can do this without a warrant is uh, uh, things like, you know, what if you had a knife on your person, right? You know, they're about to arrest you, you pull out the knife and get all stabby, this is dangerous. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's important to search all the pockets and see what's in there. Um, and the way the government was interpreting that uh, with respect to cell phones is, well, you know, if we found a phone in your pocket, it was okay for us to go in the pocket under the weapon search, and therefore it is okay for us to look at the phone, and the more aggressive ones were said, and therefore it's okay for us to connect to your cloud providers and see what you have on the cloud, and so on, because... Uh, uh, well, that, you know, you raise a good point. So he was just mentioning, well, unless they attack you with a phone. And actually, one of the things that was very important about the Riley case was they, they reminded uh, us that uh, the exception has to be tied to the justification. And that uh, the justification for search engine to arrest didn't hold true for rifling through all of the contents of the phone, let alone going onto the cloud and, and seeing what else is there. They, they, I think they had the metaphor of like, if they find a key to your house in your pocket, uh, you know, with, we'd all agree that this doesn't mean that they can go search your home without a warrant. Uh, and, and so therefore, I should say, step back. In courts, the battle of the metaphor is very important because you're explaining to the judge why the logic works, what makes it understandable. So that was a potent metaphor for the Supreme Court, ended up uh, in part of their decision, is they were like, yes, of course we wouldn't say if you had a key in your pocket, which many people do, that we're going to get rid of the warrant requirement for a house. And so therefore, why should having the phone, which has an electronic key to your cloud storage, mean that you get the cloud? And they also recognized that things had changed. Phones were different. A phone in your pocket wasn't just a device from which you could make calls. Uh, it wasn't like, uh, you know, you had a, a, a wallet and maybe they were rifling through there to see what business cards you had stuffed in there or something like that. It was your whole life. It had your photos, had your appointment calendar, your emails, where you had uh, surfed on, on the web. Like, all these things that were intimate details about your, your lives were available on a phone in the pocket. And that by applying the rule as the, uh, the government had asked, it would be making sort of the, the, the Fourth Amendment kind of a dead letter. That, that like, if they said, if you if they have, you know, uh, any, any way of lawfully having your phone, that the rest is, is now gone, we would really be stripping away a lot of the, the important uh, uh, privacy rights. Um, and so Riley said, you know, you cannot do a free search uh, incident to arrest of, of what's on the phone. Uh, you need to get a warrant. And... Uh, what we're asking in the al-Assad case is basically to apply that logic to border searches because border searches is about like are you bringing drugs into the country do you have any weapons you're smuggling uh, which is actually that's going to come up in the Colsus case um, and that that was very tenuously tied to getting onto uh, onto the phone uh, and so that applying the the Riley doctrine uh, tying the justification for having the border search exemption to what you could do, we believe requires a, uh, a warrant before they can do uh, a search of the phone. Um, and then, you know, there's, it also would be, would be great, uh, though not, you know, steps along the way. It would also be nice uh, if uh, it was clarified that uh, uh, suspicionless searches were not allowed, that uh, you know the, the the Ninth Circuit standard is a reasonable suspicion is required in some circumstances, other circuits that's not. So uh, we want to make as much progress as we can up to and ideally a warrant, and that's the al case. Um, Colossus was a this is Fourth Circuit, and again, which circuit is which sometimes matters, sometimes doesn't. I will tell you that most a lot of Eleventh Circuit judges we're in the Eleventh Circuit now are willing to be less respectful of Ninth Circuit cases because that's California. And they tend to think that a lot of the rulings in California are wacky. And so we say, no, that's just a Ninth Circuit. I mean, I've heard Judge Lewis say, well, yes, but that's Ninth Circuit. Now, I believe that the Ninth Circuit feels the same way about us, um, saying, well, yes, but that's the Eleventh Circuit. They still have mules and horses in the street. So there's. We're, we're not as evolved as we would like to be. Cole Seuss is Fourth Circuit. Um, this is a gentleman who was trying to leave the country with a suitcase full of illegal gun parts, um, tried to get on a plane in um, Dulles Airport up in D.C., well, Virginia technically. And the issue here, you know, spot on, border exemption. They knew who he was. He had tried and succeeded in doing this several times before. Before he got to the airport, he wasn't really breaking the law. He had a suitcase full of gun parts. Okay. Some of my friends have suitcases full of gun parts. 
when you try to take certain gun parts out of the country, you're breaking laws. And that's what he was doing. And they, like I said, he had a history of this. So this was not just, I think we'll search that guy. They were looking for him. But they um, did find indeed a suitcase full of illegal gun parts once he took them out of the country. And they said, oh, and by the way, you've got a phone. Sweet, we'll take that. And we're going to go break into it and find what else we can to see what other mischief you've been up to. They're looking for evidence. They use the phones that way, obviously. If you had a stack of papers, they'd look through them. We keep all of our papers on our phones now. It's just harder to figure out where the lines are. In this case, the court said, okay, look, it's a border exception, so the police have a higher right here to patrol the border than they would the streets. But going into the self, this case followed Riley, which you just heard about, which was the case saying, yeah, tearing apart the guts of a cell phone is more than just a search incident to arrest. That's another level. And this court basically said, yes, you need some particularized suspicion, individualized suspicion, because in this case, it's a non-routine search. So this case basically followed Riley, said, yeah, even it's the border, so the police have more authority, but it's a phone which is something you have an expectation of privacy in, so you gotta have something more than we're just looking. But in this case, we've got something more than we're just looking because we have this suitcase full of gun parts, so the search is fine. That's the short version of the case. So they did follow Riley and said you need a higher standard, but they had a higher standard of suspicion here, and so that was sufficient to allow the search. I can talk briefly about 11th Circuit. I'm originally from Washington State, uh, so I can kind of attest to the, the differences between the 9th Circuit and the 11th Circuit. And I think the 9th Circuit is better, so just so you know. <laughs> I shouldn't be saying that here. I like the 11th Circuit. Okay, all right. I'm old school. <laughs> all right. I'm the dissenter, I think. Um, but in the 11th Circuit, the standard, uh, as she just mentioned, um, at least in the 9th Circuit, or excuse me, 4th Circuit, <laughs> you have to have like a reasonable suspicion. But in the 9th Circuit, they basically said that for border searches, there is no standard. So well, that's the, the Cotterman case. The, well, the 9th Circuit says that there's reasonable suspicion, correct? For, for uh, forensic searches, yeah. Yes, for forensic searches, I apologize. <laughs> um, but in the 11th Circuit, uh, there is no standard like that. So just like they could search your luggage, if you're flying an international flight and it's going to and from another country, so it doesn't, it's not just leaving the country, it's if you're coming into the country as well, um, then there's basically no standard to do this forensic search. Now the manual search, of course, uh, that's the same in these circuit splits here, but in the 11th Circuit, um, even the forensic search, I think in the Colsus case, they did a forensic analysis and came up with a 900 page report and they took the phone off site for a month so that's how involved these searches can be so um, and it's interesting to look at the rationale um, they're comparing in 11th circuit they're comparing the search to physical versus like a personal so there's precedent in the 11th circuit saying that you can't like do a body cavity search. There is like, you have to have reasonable suspicion for that. But to like objects and possessions, they say that's totally different. And the precedent of like, for the bot, for the personal uh, searches doesn't apply to all the property. So there's basically no standard in 11th circuit. So depending on where you fly out, fly out of, you have to kind of know your law where you're going, whether you can be searched or not. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that, that that raises also another another point that that uh, as part of the discussion on on border searches is whether it is is sort of like a routine or non-routine search, or whether it's you know particularly of invasive or offensive. So uh, it's been fairly well established that things like a body cavity search that's not routine, it's invasive. Like that is something that re requires this sort of this higher standard. Um, and then, as we're saying, like you know, applying the, these old rules to new cir circumstances. Uh, how does that fit with with a cell phone? Um, but now let's turn actually to another aspect of cell phone privacy law, which is location. Uh, so uh, your your cell phone uh, gives away your location through a wide variety of means. It might have a GPS in it. It connects to some cell towers, uh, and so it may know your location in number of ways. And that brings us to the Carpenter case, Amy. Sure. So if you all are really, really good and confused right now about when your cell phone can and cannot be searched at the border, I'm going to talk about something 
absolutely totally different and try to confuse you even more um, how many of you have a phone so remember that the border they have a higher higher right to search so now we're not at the border anymore so now we have you know less right on the side of the police more right on the side of the people because we're no longer going in and out of the country so different rules different results but different rules how many of you have a cell phone on you anybody not have a cell phone on you okay wow. not in here so <laughs> Right now, there's a company out there who knows exactly where you're located. Um, because by virtue of you having a phone on you and by virtue of that phone being on and functioning, supposedly, um, it has to know where you are in order to work. Um, that's just a, a very basic point of technical fact. Um, there are several ways that they can figure out where you're located. So if you have, for example, a map turned on, that mapping feature might have your location, GPS can have your location. You're also pinging off of cell phone towers, which is why when your phone is turned on, they know where you're working, or they know where you're working. They know where you're located, um, because as you move through space, they have to know what tower to ping you off of in order for you to receive information or make phone calls. Um, now this, the precedent for Carpenter, before I get to actually what the Carpenter case was, goes all the way back to 1970s, Yes. I'm, I'm curious. How close do they know? It depends where on you where you are. Like cell tower location. It depends on where you are. Exactly. Yeah. If there are more towers around you, you're in a more concentrated area, like Atlanta. Um, they're going to know where you are with much more um, particularity. Whereas if you're they know which room we're in. Yeah. They know which seat you picked. <laughs> they know what you look like. You, when you're sleeping, they know when you're yeah, awake. That whole kind of Santa Claus is a creepy stalker? Yeah, nothing like a cell phone. They're way, yeah. way worse. They know when you're sleeping and awake. Yeah. yeah. And yours will wake you up because it wants you to sleep. <laughs> this is, anyway, um, we're going to go back uh, to 1979 um, briefly. Uh, Put, get in your time machines, get in your TARDISes, there's one downstairs, we're all, we all are aware of that, we're at Dragon Con. Um, that, back to 1979, there's a case called Smith v. Maryland, and what Smith v. Maryland decided, Supreme Court case, is essentially, and we're going to kind of go back to some of the introduction point here, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy, and data, you, they, they think I'm funny, uh, <laughs> and data you turn over to a third party like a cell phone company, or at that time, just a normal phone company. Um, so for example, at that point, it was if you dial a phone number, the phone company is using that phone number. You have to give it to the phone company, to AT&T, to route the phone call. So AT&T knows who you're calling because you're calling them and they make the phone call. You supposedly have no reasonable expectation of privacy in those phone numbers. Now today, you use your cell phone for everything. Um, your cell phone provider knows what apps you use, when you're using them, where you, all of this information. Um, and so fast forward and technology has changed. How are go we going to apply this third party doctrine to a time when your phone knows everything about you? And that was one of the questions that um, the Carpenter case is wrestling with. So in the Carpenter case, police, without a warrant, went and received um, a, a dump, a ton of location information about a few of these individuals off of a cell phone tower to figure out where they were located for a given period of time. Um, they did it, like, as I said, without a warrant, got all of this location information, and then they were able to use that location information in court in order to um, prosecute those individuals. And the challenge was that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy in that information, that it is, does not fall under this old rule in Smith v. Maryland. And before they get this massive amount of location information, um, police should have to go through some sort of, show some sort of standard, um, like the probable cause standard that is necessary to get a warrant. Um, and the Supreme Court in the Carpenter case actually agreed. Um, so they took the, the case um, and reversed the decision below and said essentially that location tracking at this volume over this amount of time, and we're not totally sure, there's some dicta in the case that points to like a seven day 
stand, like, you might be able to get seven days' worth of information, but maybe not eight days' worth of information without a warrant. We're not totally sure where that standard's going to lie. But essentially that this information is super sensitive. They can't fall within this third-party doctrine. Um, we have to start creating new rules for location information um, received from cell phone companies or through cell phone towers. Um, to make matters a little more difficult, there are other pieces that this case didn't answer. So for example, police um, in many locations in the US will set up fake cell phone towers to track um, user cell phone location um, and where you're located. This case doesn't answer that question. This case leaves a lot of different things open, but it was a huge leap forward from what we had previously just a, a word about a 2012 case, U.S. v. Jones, that had previously set the standard and that we're going to relate back to a lot. Um, in 2012, police in, in Virginia, I believe, was it, it was D.C. It was D.C., but it was, I think, the warrant. Was okay. Virginia, D.C., Maryland, whatever. Um, they're all the same, trust me. I'm from Virginia, they're all the same. Virginia's better. I'm from Maryland, they're the same. Uh, <laughs> they're all the same. I live in D.C., so you got the whole area represented <laughs> right here. Um, police had attached a GPS tracker to a car of a criminal suspect and followed him for a period of 30 days um, and said that they didn't need a warrant to do that. Oddly enough, in this case, fun fact, they had a warrant, but it was totally not relevant because it was issued in either D.C. or Virginia or Maryland, and it was... <laughs> executed in one other of the way. other ones. Yeah, I think the warrant was Virginia and the search was, was Maryland. I could, I, I just, Sorry, I guys. Been, it's been know. years. 2012 was a long time ago. There was a different president. They haven't read the case. Just pick one. They won't know better. <laughs> Us lawyers have to make sure and get it right. So. They applied in, in D.C. In DC and they and executed in the Maryland. And day, they, they did in Maryland. So warrant wasn't, it, they Lawyers. had one, but it wasn't really good. Close, but close um, doesn't count in warrants. And at that point, the Supreme Court had said um, unanimously that this was a search in the Fourth Amendment and that the government was required to get a warrant before they carried it out. Now, they tied that to the physical placement mm -hmm. of the GPS device on the car. They said at its very heart, if nothing else, the Fourth Amendment protects you from having something placed on your property to track you for a period of time. But there's what several people call a shadow majority from the U.S. v. Jones case. Some people take offense to this, um, but a shadow majority of people, uh, of justices, who had said that even without the physical placement of the device, they thought they would be willing to find a search for a period of location tracking of 30 days. Now, they didn't make the holding on that because they could, said they could hold on more narrow grounds. Now, the Supreme Court is often likely to say, we might be willing to say this, but we don't have to get to that argument right now because we can make a decision on this much smaller issue. And law in the U.S. evolves very, very slowly on purpose, yeah. sometimes to great frustration. Um, and so... They decided to only hold a small issue. And so coming back in Carpenter, we see the evolution of the Jones decision to saying there is even a privacy interest in this tower information that this company receives without the physical placement of the device. Um, there are going to be further cases that come out of this to continue answering these questions. And one of the things that I think we at Access Now find more interesting is it gets to some of the question that was brought up at the beginning about public um, public information. When you perform in public, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? Well, if you're standing on a street corner, probably not, we said. But what if you have cameras that are tracking your public movements all the time? What if you have a drone sitting over Atlanta that can track where you are and where you're going and what you're doing 24 hours a day? even in public. And I think some of what we're seeing in the Carpenter cell phone cases is going to be used in the future to determine when surveillance gets even more pervasive um, and more constant, what those rules are going to be. So this is gonna be a case that's used in, I think, a lot of different perspectives moving forward and will help shape the law in these areas. So if you, if you think to where these laws started, or at least the ruling started, 
there aren't any laws here. It's all just the Supreme Court thinking about the Constitution. But when they used to talk about surveillance, surveilling someone didn't need a warrant because it was something they were doing in public where they could be seen. But there were always, if nothing else, very practical constraints on that because if there's policemen in a big marked cruiser with lights on the back following you around, you'll notice unless you're staring at your phone, then you're oblivious. But that was before phones, so people noticed things around them. And, you know, first off, you'll see it. And second off, there's monetary restraints here. You can't, you know, dispatch a bunch of cops to follow every person who's suspicious around. So they didn't have to worry if the surveillance would become overwhelming because it wasn't really possible. Well, now, as she mentioned, drones are cheap. And the, the idea of very specific surveillance in public, but tracking your motions to a level that was never anticipated before, it's a different issue. And so this is where the law has to figure out what it's gonna do, but there's the um, tension between, well, you're in public, and we all learned in law school that if you're in public, there's no re expectation of privacy with, wait a minute, you mean you know exactly where I went and how long I was in? you know, Dairy Queen and what I ordered, okay, now I'm getting a little creeped out, and where does that line need to be drawn now? Because possibilities are different, so the law kind of has to be different. It just gets there slowly, as Amy said. Yeah, a question. Um, so, how does the law evolve when, uh, you know, helicopters are first uh, you know, as police vehicles to you know, surveil on the criminal activity? Um, I mean, there, there, I don't recall a helicopter case in particular. There was an earlier case involving a beeper uh, that was placed on, on, on a car uh, or the placed in... The beeper was okay, the GPS was not. Yeah, it was, and then they put the, the beeper inside a drum of some precursor chemicals for some bad Does thing. Does anybody know what a beeper is? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Not a pager. Uh, if you don't know, ask not your parents. A like, it's, a, right. it's like a, a piece of metal almost. There's an episode of Scrubs about this. I know that dates <laughs> me. Um, it's like a piece of metal, and you put it in something, and then there's a receiver, and it transmits. And so the receiver beeps louder when it's close, and less loud when it's like hide and seek um, with technology. So they have the to be close. The airplanes to and helicopters, when they started being used, th there were cases, and people the were having the same planes, discussions yeah. as now. It's like, wait, Photos. no one's ever been able to see the top of your house before. And people said, rats, that's not the place to hide bodies. There were cases about anything that can be seen Basement if you're flying overhead without, you know, ripping shrubberies apart is in, fit, is in plain view and counts as if it could be seen from the street. There was even a case that said it was okay to do infrared scans so that if you were growing a certain herbal crop inside a greenhouse, it has a higher infrared signature than other plants. Not okay. And they could, they were able to do that most of the time. They, you the aren't able. Okay. You needed a warrant if you were using technology that wasn't generally available in public use. And at that time, it, it wasn't. Yeah, I, mean, I think you you time. could say that it, it since has. So, but I think we're we're getting a little so you know the, far so far law, afield here. Yeah. So yes, there were airplane cases, and they were oh no, the world's changed, just like we say now. One, because there aren't a lot of them, uh, and also because if you think about just the practicalities of operating a helicopter, that's a lot of money. Uh, and that's part of the reason probably there are more of them, because uh, it, it costs a lot of cash to, to put them up And they're not subtle. You can be followed, have, there could be a drone hovering outside your window. The helicopter, you would know about it. So, uh, we, so I think we have a question here in the front row, and then we'll get to you uh, there in the, in the mid-back. You, you Go ahead. Carpenter and some of the um, maybe and some of the others as well that says you know really 
what this originally was was property based. We added this notion of privacy later in the jurisprudence, and it was Supreme Court cases that added that in. If I weren't scattered, I would tell you the name of the case. They would know it. Um, but so you, there was a point when that was mm -hmm. added in is how we will decide what's unreasonable. It's not in the Constitution. The Constitution started with your stuff. I have you know, my papers, my effects, and most particularly my house. And okay, my car. The extension, the extension from house to car was easy because it's still my place, my effects. Well, the phone is property, but that's really where a more straightforward analysis goes is down the property role rather than the privacy one. Privacy is more popular, especially in this room, because it gives you greater protection. And so a lot of these things also come up in the, in the form of uh, you know, exceptions, right? So the, the, the sort of the notion that, you know, your phone is your property would not be contested very hard. But like in the Riley case, it was dealing with an exception, which was search incident to arrest. Uh, in the uh, uh, Carpenter uh, case, it was dealing with the exception of a third-party doctrine because they're getting their records from the phone company, not your phone. So, like, it, it, it's not so much that the, the the property idea would be a new, fresh one for for this, but rather that we're we're sort of in the world of of exceptions to uh, the the generalized rule. And like, and then the car, like, there's a notion of a you know, if you're stopped by the police, they can do, look in your wingspan. Uh, so this is like where you could search for a weapon, but that means your trunk, if something's in the trunk, then uh, they need to get a, a warrant or, uh, you know, your consent. But they can also then call the dog, and then the dog can sniff at your trunk and bark, and then they now have, a, uh, and then can use that to get the, the warrant, uh, and, and so on. So, like, it is like Inception. It's layers upon layers, you know, uh, all, all, the way, all the way down. Turtles, turtles all the way down. Can I make just a quick Please. side point? Um, one of the, the so your phone is basically anybody who is my age or older remembers filing cabinets, and your phone is basically a massive filing cabinet. It's all of your papers that you used to keep in your home, and one of the interesting issues that I think we're going to continue to fight about as phones become searched more and more is the there's a part of the Fourth Amendment that talks about particularity. Um, the warrant has to be particular about what what they're allowing to be searched. Um, so they couldn't open desk drawers to find a basketball because there's no possible, if they are searching for a basketball and there's no possible way there's a basketball in this desk drawer, they're not going to be able to do that. On a phone, the, the particularity issue gets a little bit more complicated. And I think one of the reasons people have issues with warrants for cell phones is that they generally allow you to look at everything um, or it's hard to restrict you to only looking at certain things. Um, and that's for digital devices wholesale. And so the idea of particularity in digital searches becomes a bigger issue. And I want to flag that because it's when we're talking about the home, that was always like a really set rule. There are things that places you can look and things that you can try to find. Digital devices that becomes much more funny and fuzzy and weird. That's yeah. for warrants. Remember we said that was there are restrictions on what how warrants have to be. And that's not the same issue as search and seizure being reasonable or not. That was what you're allowed to look for when you do have a warrant. All right, so uh, the question there, yeah. Is it on? All right, <laughs> speak loud. Uh, yeah, I mean these these are these are very uh, very tough questions that, uh, and a lot of this is implicated by the third party doctrine where they go and demand the information from the third party. Uh, then there's the the separate issue. Well, what if it's not demanding it from the third party? What if they just up and sell it uh, as as a commercial uh, service? Um, and yeah, this is definitely a, an issue coming up. I think the the uh, government's position uh, and with, with relative success has been that they're they're free to go buy things out in the marketplace. Nothing you can do to stop them. Uh, so this is a good reason for you to try and keep as much of your information away from that as you can. It's harder and harder. So to uh, to piggyback on that, um, there was 
folks remember the good old days of 2015, uh, there was a proceeding going on at the FCC, and this ties back into sort of net neutrality, but basically as a result of what the FCC did to effectuate the, the 2015 net neutrality rules, they then had the legal obligation to promulgate rules about what ISPs could and could not do with the data that their customers had to hand them for the purposes of using them as an ISP. So going back to the days of the telephone, you know, you had to hand a number to, there were certain data that you had to give to AT&T for them to route your call. You had to give them the number, they had to keep track of the time that the call went out, they had to keep track of the duration of the call, usually. Um, and that doesn't tell you the contents of the call, but it tells you a lot, uh, and especially when you get it in large quantities. Uh, now, think about that on the scope of Comcast, uh, which does not have, maybe they claim, oh, we don't have the actual URLs you went to. Well, no, but you have the IP address I, I dialed from, the IP address I dialed to when I did it, the amount of traffic that came through. Uh, the, you can tell a lot just by the pattern of the number and volume of packets and the frequency at which they are coming in and out of my house. Um, and Verizon in particular, so Verizon bought AOL uh, not too long ago, and they bought it specifically for its advertising arm. Uh, and so ISPs are very much looking to get into this sort of big data analytics. They want to knock Google off the advertising throne, uh, Google and Amazon. Uh, and so there were rules promulgated. Um, they weren't perfect, but they were pretty good. They were certainly better than nothing. Uh, and then the election happened, and then within three months, they were repealed by Congress uh, under the Congressional Review Act. So currently, it's a free-for-all. Uh, essentially, your ISP, there's nothing stopping them from bundling all of the data that they have, or your metadata traffic, and then selling it uh, and using it to inject advertisements. Um, and so I think that is part of what people are, you know, this tends to come up mostly in the context of Facebook and Google and sort of ed edge platforms is one of the terms of art, um, about what kinds of data. And there's this whole, you know, there's, there is an, art, an aspect to that argument which says, well, to some extent, you as the consumer are handing over your data voluntarily to people like Google and Facebook. And there's a debate about how much that's actually true, but rhetorically that's how that kind of comes up a lot. Um, when it's your ISP, you literally don't have a choice uh, to get, an, if you're like most Americans, you have one ISP provider at your home, so if you want to use the internet, Comcast is going to get to watch your traffic go by. Uh, and so arguably it is an even more critical set of provisions. Uh, now under this FCC, we are not going to get privacy rules, that's just the reality of, of the current administration. Uh, but this is a debate that people are having. Um, it is something people are very aware of, and I think it's something that people are starting to actually raise a little bit more hell about. Correctly. And if you want to hear more about this, come to the GDPR panel at 7 o'clock <laughs> tonight in this room. <laughs> wait, wait, wait what's, what is the GDPR? The, the gen General, General Data Protection <laughs> Regulation. We really always miss the R. That is exactly the kind of question you should bring tonight, here at 7 o'clock. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, how about in the light blue? Uh, so the question is, is, is whether judicial activism uh, or presidential or legislative action. So you're talking about the three branches of government and how they interplay here. Um, judicial activism is an interesting term because people tend to apply that when they say they don't like what the court does, that's judicial activism. Uh, and if they like what it does, it's you know impact litigation or something. Uh, but, but be that as it may, uh, a lo yeah, the constitutional law tends to be um, shaped by the judiciary because uh, the legislature can't change the constitution and the executive is charged with, uh, well, executing the laws of the country faithfully. Um, and so, uh, and the Supreme Court, in one of their uh, first rulings, made it clear it was their job to say what the law is. Um, so most of the uh, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence comes from the Supreme Court, though it is definitely shaped a bit by, by Congress, because Congress will say, can, can say, like, you, you have to do a subpoena here and get a warrant there. I mean, they can make more restrictive uh, rules. Um, Mario. Luigi. Luigi. Sorry. Um, all right. I had a question uh, about biometrics and security. Uh, there was a circuit case where they said the cops could force you to use your thumbprint to unlock your phone, but couldn't force you to disclose your password. Uh, how does that work as we move towards Face ID and that type of uh, security profile? So, uh, no, I'll, I'll just 
all the like three seconds of what I know about this. On a general high level, and like kind of an easy way to think about it, is if it is on the outside of your body, that it, like biometric data, and someone can get it by looking at you, uh, then generally it's not subject to like warrant requirements. So that's why you get thumb printed when you get when you get fingerprinted when you get arrested in a lot of cases. Um, so face ID, yes, they can. If you're really concerned, do not turn face ID on your phone. Uh, cops can literally take this thing, point it at your face. Whoop, it's unlocked. Have fun with my contacts. Uh, <laughs> fingerprint unlocking, same thing. They can they can actually force you to put your fingerprint on. Um, so always always use passcode. So this is a you. I plead the fifth. Like this is pleading the fifth amendment. Um, it only applies to testimonial information, which is what your password would be. Something you know, information that you have, um, and not the information on the outside. So when you think of what you can say, like, I will not say this because I might incriminate myself, um, that only can apply to, and that's where, you, that's where people withhold their passwords. I am going to withhold my password pursuant to the Fifth Amendment because I might incriminate myself. Um, can only do that to a physical piece of information. Now, you can forcibly apply the wrong finger to your, pa like, I always tell people use a weird finger on your fingerprint if you're going to do it. Um, so it, because it only takes 10 tries and then it locks your phone down. But that's not legal advice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, another thing to do if you're about to cross a, a border, um, that'd be a great time to just turn your phone off. They, they you know, because uh, uh, at least all, all the uh, modern phones uh, once off require the password and like the face and the fingerprint and whatever else will not open it afterwards. So that's, you know, and you don't really need to be taking calls in the, in the borderline. Um, all right, so we'll follow the box. Uh, the Carpenter case involved local police requesting uh, location data via, via cellular methods. Um, a 2018 New York Times article implied that uh, the National Security Services obtain that same data via upstream collection. In her book, American Spies, Jennifer Granick discussed how that data is shared with DEA even local law enforcement for routine procedures. Does Carpenter provide any protection against the same location information obtained through a federal route like that? Oh, you want to really give that a shot? Or, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very good question. Um, and one, uh, I think maybe I'll just say as a threshold matter, one of the more interesting things as a lawyer working in this space for the next several years will be how does Carpenter apply to other places? And as a privacy uh, advocate, uh, I'm going to be saying Carpenter applies all over the place. And the government's going to be saying Carpenter is a very, very narrow decision and only applies in a um, few uh, small places. So that's what we're going to be arguing. All right. Yes, please. Um, ooh. One of the things that a couple of my forensic professors have repeated in class is that if we're dealing with, if we know we're going to be dealing with uh, customs and borders, if we have the ability to, um, to just delete our accounts off of our phone as we pass through, um, I was wondering if that's considered something viable. Um, so I've actually given a full uh, hour talk on uh, crossing <laughs> the border and the things that you can, you can do about that. So I believe we have negative one minute. So uh, I will be... What? It's not here. I, I've given it elsewhere. Sorry. It's on the internet, actually. Uh, I gave it at the uh, Chaos Communications Congress uh, just this past uh, 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 December. Uh, so Kurt Opsahl, I can see the name here and, and look that up. CCC is the conference. And uh, it was with my, me and my colleague Bill uh, covering the legal policy issues and technical protections that you can have. But I will give you a brief, brief over. I think you're, you're hitting upon the best rule about how to protect yourself when crossing the border. Don't bring it. So they can only take what you have with you. It's a big pain in the ass to do this, but like, let's say you had a Chromebook or some sort of like, you know, netbook that didn't actually have anything on it. Then as you cross the border, you know, you can hand over your, your, your computer. 
um, and they, there's nothing for them to to find on it because the data exists elsewhere uh, on you know on the cloud or, or some such. Now, is that a complete depiction? It depends on what your your threat model is, uh, because if you want the data on the far end, then you're going to have to get it over the cloud, and then you have to be sure that your method of getting it is going to be uh, uh, protective. But uh, removing the data or not bringing it in the first place. Uh, and then, of course, you have to make sure that you know if you're removing the data, you remove it well. Uh, some forensic uh, technology is pretty good at finding data that had been uh, deleted, especially if you just push the delete button and do nothing more. Uh, so, like this, this is this is hard. Uh, but if you're going into uh, a, over a border where you have some reason to believe that they might be interested in your stuff, that might be worth those extra uh, kind of uh, uh, annoying precautions. And yeah, you know, you're, you're so uh, your threat model might be to take a few extra precautions. Uh, all right, so yeah, I mean, uh, how, how are we doing on time? I think we're we'll just wrap. So last question then. Uh, so a question about Smith. Uh, I dial a phone number. I get a phone bill that tells me I dialed a phone number and how long it occurred and when it took place. Obviously nowadays I have no idea. I dial a phone number. I have no idea what else is going on. How has the course been receptive to the idea that if I don't know, then how did I consent? Uh, all right, so just so to, if I don't yeah. know what data I'm I'm giving out when I use my phone, but okay. in Smith is very clear that I get a phone bill. I know that AT and T was recording me. All right, I, th I think I under, under, understand the the question is, is looking at so Smith v Maryland from the late seventies. Uh, dealing with uh, digits uh, dialed, uh, you're handing that over to the phone company, you're getting a bill back. And um, one of the things with modern phones is they often be unlimited number of calls. You know, you, you're, you're, it's, it's metered in minutes, or maybe you have unlimited minutes, et cetera. Um, and so there, there has been some arguments I've seen about, um, well, since this is no longer a necessary business record, because they don't really need to know what number you you dialed that maybe this should be treated differently um, and then there's another thing coming out of the carpenter case that is that well when you're attaching to a cell tower it's like not voluntary in a true voluntariness sense you kind of have to do it to participate in modern society and someone could try to apply those things uh, that all being being said um, I, I think that uh, we'll have to see how that goes uh, Amy or well I think carpenter, anyone else? Third party really has little to do with consent necessarily. Um, it really has to do with what information you're turning over to another person. Um, and so that could be any source of data, so long as you're turning it over to a third party and you don't have to consent to that. What is going to be at issue is this notion of voluntary data you turn over, um, because Carpenter did look quite a bit at the fact that um, the phone numbers were voluntarily turned over, whereas your location is not something you voluntarily turn over to the phone company and they made that distinction. So we might see different distinctions like that pop up, but I don't think they're going to bring it back to consent again, I mean, at least not for this issue. All right, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um,